Hi, everyone. This is Kate Stevens. Welcome back to another episode of the Omni Channel Marketer. Today, I'm excited to have Melanie Travis, founder of Andy, to join us on the podcast today. Hi, Melanie. How are you? Hi, Kate. I'm great. Thanks for having me. How are you? Good. We were just chatting about you know how Melanie went to Taylor Swift this weekend, and I am <laughs> Truly so jealous. So maybe I will get to, you know, one of the remaining concerts. Anyway, so switching gears, would love to, you know, hear a little bit more about your personal background that, you know, led you to founding Andy. Yeah. So, I mean, my background is really in the startup ecosystem in New York. I started my career at a company called Foursquare back in the heyday. It was really cool to check in and be mayor of your favorite coffee shop. I don't know if you remember those days. And then from there, I went to Kickstarter, the crowdfunding platform. And then from Kickstarter, I went to Bark, which is best known for BarkBox, the monthly box of toys and treats for your dog, public via SPAC in 2021. And uh, so so really kind of did the tour of these sort of fast growing venture backed consumer internet companies and loved it, loved the experience. And frankly, wanted to start my own thing. And so I would say Andy was born from a, you know, desire to start a company and and sort of like run run that race, more so than like a lifelong passion for swim, just being honest. But once I knew that I wanted to start my own company, then, you know, I went searching for the right idea. I had a lot of really bad ideas mm-hmm. and I stuck on swim uh, when I was going on a on a retreat with Barkbox to a lake in upstate New York and I thought, okay, I'm going to need a swimsuit. Well, what type of swimsuit should I wear with my CEO and my colleagues? And that search led me on a frustrating journey through the swimwear landscape. And I was like, why isn't there a company that's just like, that makes, you know, like well-made suits that are, that are beautiful, that are easy to wear, easy to shop for, where you can look and feel your best that aren't too sexy, but aren't too matronly. And I mean, I would say that pretty much defines Andy today. That's that's why we were born. And it turns out I'm not the only woman who, you know, hated shopping for swim because it's been a pretty remarkable story since then. So that was a little bit more about the origin. You know, just tell me a little bit more about what is Andy today? You know, what is the what does the brand look like? Yeah. So today Andy is a global swimwear brand for women. We are primarily United States based, like 90% of our business is US, but then the remainder is Australia, which is, you know, somewhat significant driven seasonality. And we're we're primarily online. So we're D2C. Uh, we're primarily e-com, but we have we do have some stores and we also have wholesale presence with with some department stores. So we have owned brick and mortar, we have department stores, and we have our our D2C, you know, our .com. And how did you, you know, did you launch D2C first? And how did you think about that as your channel? Yeah. So yes, we started with andyswim.com. And uh, we were only D2C for the first six years now, maybe for the first four years. And, you know, the main reason for that is to collect data about our consumer, to understand who she is, what she likes, what she wants, where she lives, so that we could make better and better product for her and, and so that we could be sure to serve our customer with, with what she wants and where she is. And also, to, you know, we could get smart about remarketing because I'm sure okay, you have more than one swimsuit in your swim drawer. Presumably you have a few. The average American woman has, I think it's six to eight, and that can flex up quite a bit. And so, you know, we want to have a significant share of your swim drawer. And so, you know, once you know who your customer is and what she's buying for and when she's buying, you can, if you know those things, then you can remarket to her to drive up those repeat purchases. So sort of, I'm jumping right into the weeds here, but I think uh, there are a lot of reasons that I thought it made sense to start, you know, just, just with our online presence. And then once we had a good sense of our audience and they love us, then it would make sense to start branching out into omnichannel distribution, which is what we've been doing for the last, you know, 18 to 24 months, really. So tell us more about omnichannel distribution and, you know, where you're focusing. So we're taking, I guess, I kind of think about the business as like a three-legged stool. I guess all stools have three legs. No, some have four, I suppose. Ours has three for the purpose of this exercise. Um, <laughs> and we have a very like well-defined, strong leg with our online, you know, e-com presence. But but to be, you know, a mature brand, you, you really do need the other legs of the stool here. And so I'm, I'm saying all this to say that like, we're, we're actually kind of focused on both at the same parallel. We have our store our owned brick and mortar and pop-up strategy so we are a seasonal business and so it doesn't really make sense to roll out like you know 15 20 year leases and all the major 
cities because like, I mean, let's just be honest here. Not that many people are buying swimsuits in the Northeast in October. And so, but however, we have a huge presence in the Northeast. And so, you know, pop-up strategy makes sense for us here. And we've done that in, in obviously the Hamptons and Martha's Vineyard. Uh, we have one right now in Soho in New York City. And then we have a year round, you know, like very long term lease for a flagship location in Malibu because Malibu is seasonless, you could say. And so on the West Coast, we are pursuing that strategy. And then obviously Florida, we do pop ups for the snowbird season, like Q1. And then uh, so that that's sort of like owned brick and mortar and pop ups and how we think about that. And obviously there's a lot more to unpack there, which I'm happy to. And then there's there's wholesale. And we started our wholesale journey with sort of small beachside brick and mortar boutiques, really, to have a presence in places where we are not. And that has been very successful and has been growing steadily year over year. And then we finally decided it's time to go big and go with the bigger sort of big box retailers. And so this year we're launching actually this week in Nordstrom across, I believe it's 15 doors. And, you know, we obviously hope and expect to increase it from there. And so we're, we're really developing the wholesale stool leg, if I can beat that metaphor to death, as we, as we, as we, you know, sort of evolve as a brand. Um, so, so the so brick and mortar and wholesale are really sort of in parallel, but of course, e-com remains the biggest, most important channel for us. How do you think about like your own pop-ups as opposed to like a beachside boutique? Like, do they serve different roles? Yeah. And, you know, how do you think about those differently? Beachside boutiques are a very like low lift and cost effective, yes, cost effective way to enter certain markets. But you're not really, I mean, again, going back to knowing your customer, understanding who she is, when you sell to a boutique, that's kind of the end of the the road for us. I mean, you know, we build a relationship with the boutique, of course, and we hope to expand our presence with them. Um, but we don't know who's going in and out of the store, who in particular is buying our product. And and also like we're mixed in. Sometimes we're mixed in with other swim, but either way, we're definitely mixed in with other products. And so it's not as impactful for the consumer as our own pop-up. So for example, the Hamptons is a great market for us. And we used to just do other boutiques. And then we opened our own store in Sag Harbor on Main Street seasonally. And that has been just enormously successful, both the, the sort of scale and volume that we're able to sell in that store, but also the brand awareness. I mean, having your own brick and mortar on the main drag, you know, in the Hamptons is, I mean, that you know, like, that's, a, that's just a great marketing technique. When I stand outside the store, the sheer number of people that walk by and look, and even if they don't go in, they're like, oh, Andy, oh, swim. Yeah. You know, and so it's getting more word out. So I guess this is a long winded way of saying goal, I think is probably to go with pop-ups, but you know, that requires sort of an upfront capital allocation, it requires more resources, you know, a PO for a beachside boutique is quite easy to achieve. So, you know, there's, there's trade-offs and there's some places that just don't make sense for us to invest in. There's a lot of the sort of beachside boutiques on the Eastern seaboard as you go down, you know, towards South Carolina, Georgia, I mean, Florida, where we wouldn't like necessarily go and invest a ton of resources and capital, but like, it's great to have that exposure even in a boutique. So it, it depends on the market a little bit too. So, you know, you, you mentioned you could go a little deeper on the pop-ups and I'd love to take the opportunity to do so just given that you clearly have, you know, a seasonal business that has defined markets where it makes sense to have like that heightened brand awareness. So what are some of the things that, you know, when you're planning a pop-up that you're thinking about and the considerations I know you mentioned up from capital, can you kind of walk me through a little bit more about, you know, the pop-up business? Yeah. Well, so we always look at, you know, zip codes of like the the highest zip codes where most purchases are made. And then we'll look at where those people spend their summers. And so, you know, for the Hamptons, for example, we know that our, we know that our customer is in the Hamptons in the summer. And so it just kind of makes sense to go. I will caveat this by saying this year is a bit of a test year because we actually are doing a pop-up in Soho for the summer, which previously I would have said, well, our customer is, you know, out East or traveling in the summer, but there are a lot of people in New York city. And so I was curious to see if in the heart of the city through the summer could also work. But in any case, so the first thing that we do is look at zip code, you know, penetration and see where that makes sense. You know, I generally think that whether it's a pop-up or frankly, any marketing investment, it makes sense to go where your customer is 
versus trying to start building awareness in a new place. And that goes for like even the celebrities that we work with. Last year we worked with Demi Moore. This year we're working with Mindy Kaling on on special collections. And we work with celebrities that are within our target demographic versus, you know, like basically suffice it to say your dollar is more effective and goes farther when you are playing in an area where you already have awareness. Andy is not the only swimwear brand in the world. It's not like we have fully penetrated, you know, we, we don't have a hundred percent penetration anywhere. And so to continue building on momentum is in a way easier, frankly, than, than starting from ground zero somewhere. So that's the first thing that we look at pop-ups to make sure that we're going to be in an area where our customer already is. And so that was true. Hamptons, it's true in Malibu. And then, you know, then we'll look at the length of time that the pop-up will be on. Sometimes it's three months, sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's 12 months. And, and then allocate, you know, upfront CapEx is such that we hope that, you know, we'll amortize those costs over the length of the pop-up. And we, we want our pop-ups to be profitable over the course of it. So, you know, we're not going to spend, you know, 200 grand on a pop-up that's going to last for two months because you're, I mean, we're not going to make that back in two months along with, you know, when you layer in all the other costs. And so, so that's sort of how we think about, you know, the investment that we'll make in it. But Malibu, on the other hand, is, I mean, that we intend to be in the Malibu Country Mart forever and always. And so we spent quite a lot of money to to build out that store and make it exactly what we wanted. Because we know that over time, that will make sense for us. And so you grew up in the digitally native world and you started that way as a brand. So I think you probably think a lot about, you know, the LTV of your customer and, you know, that repeat purchase rate. Now mm-hmm. you're doing, you know, pop-ups where you, you know, you, I just noticed that you said, do we want that to be profitable? How do you think about you know, as you're growing wholesale, you know, with your Nordstrom launch, how will Mm -hmm. you start to think about your customer that is coming through these wholesale channels from a, like, how do you even think about LTV in wholesale? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, if I'm just being really honest right now, I'm, I'm not, um, we should be. And obviously with our e-com business, like we are very deep in LTV, LTV to CAC, LTV by style, by like every, every way that you can possibly slice the metrics, but with wholesale, because it's relatively new, our general approach has been to, to test and see and get a sense. Like we have scale expectations for wholesale, and you know, you're talking to the CEO. I think it's very possible that if you spoke to people who are more involved in each particular project, they would have savvier things to say. But from where I sit, I'm like, okay, I want to contribute, you know, X million dollars to our revenue from wholesale this year. How do we get there? And that's that's how I think about wholesale. Are we going to add five percent, ten percent? You know, how what what how meaningful can this channel be? And over time, where where will it be? How do we get this channel to scale to you know twenty million, fifty million, et cetera? And so that that's where I am in, the, in our particular wholesale journey. But I don't know. I think it's a great question. I don't know how we think about LTV of those wholesale customers. I do think that now what I understand is that a lot of these department stores are are getting a little more involved in sharing information because they themselves are learning more information. They're, you know, they've had to sort of shift the way that they do business, but I couldn't tell you right now exactly what those, you know, more sophisticated sort of D to C metrics would look like from, from all in, in our wholesale channels. So what you do know is like what you do digitally when you know your customers. So you, how are you using that data to inform either your merchandising or your your partnership with Nordstrom? You know, with this launch, like, is how like, talk me through how that's working and how you're you know hoping to set like you know the the brand up for success with that launch. I would say it starts from a product perspective. Um, so we're obviously not giving Nordstrom you know our whole catalog. There's a lot of styles that will remain just at Andy.com. AndySwim.com or Andy.com both work. So I <laughs> I use them interchangeably. And we have bestseller sort of tried and true suits. They're called our icon collection. And that's the collection that we're starting with in Nordstrom. We know that it resonates with the customer. We know we, we know a lot about this product and who buys it. And we think that the sort of concentric circles of Andy and Nordstrom sort of like merge around these icon suits. And so that's what makes sense to start with. Um, so from a product perspective, that's how we're thinking about it. Um, and then, you know, we're not rolling out in every single Nordstrom. So then we basically, just like I was saying with our pop-up strategy, we looked at the available doors with Nordstrom and we 
we've crossed that against our highest penetration zip codes and we selected doors where we already have the most customers again using that same strategy of like let's not go to i don't think they offered us a door in alaska but we also don't have many customers in alaska so like that wasn't going to be a location had it been on offer for us to i don't know if nordstrom has an anchorage location it's not that far from seattle but anyway i'll get out of like nordstrom's own geopolitical stuff but makes complete sense and when you, you know, going back to the, the pop-ups and, you know, the zip code strategy, you know, one of the questions that I was rem reminded of, I've heard of brands when they launch in retail, they see, you know, a spike in their D2C traffic in surrounding disc uh, zip codes. Is that something mm -hmm. that you've seen with Andy as well? So we're launching this week and it is something we hope and expect to see, but too soon to say. Okay. Have you, have you seen it with the pop-ups as, like, as a behavior? Oh, yes, we have. Yeah. When, when okay. we're in parts of Florida or out East, uh, it, there's absolutely a halo effect on our, on our e-com business. Um, so it, I think that's strategy. true. Yeah, cool. exactly. So shifting gears to our topic focus um, could be, you know, with work or not, but something that you are, you know, bold or passionate or feel passionately about. A lot of things that, that I could say here. I mean, if I were to go really big, the thing that I'm most passionate about is, frankly, the, the sort of changing landscape of consumer behavior around SWIM. And how I believe that there will be a a go to, you know, sort of dominant swim player. I think if you think about other cat, this is something that I've been saying since I started Andy, and I believe remains true today. If you think about other categories like mattresses, you had you know a, a, a dominant player, Sealy, sort of whatever, razors, Gillette. I mean, you could like go across categories, and there's sort of like your big dominant player. When I started Andy, a lot of people said, well, this is not going to succeed because it's not a category where there's a big dominant player. And I said, well, I mean, that's exactly the opportunity. There is no oh. dominant player. It's a very fractured landscape, and but there will be, there's no reason for there not, not to be. And in fact, I think Swin lends itself particularly well to that because if you nail fit, which is I mean, like a, a well-fitting swimsuit is essential. There's nothing worse than you know, some suit that's like saggy or too tight or whatever. So if you can really nail that, we've been really focused on that then you'll, you'll get that customer, the, the woman to keep coming back to you. And I think if you, you know, dovetail our timing with the rise of, you know, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, but like these sort of like, you know, selfies and you, you where do you take the most photos? Well, me in particular, I take them when I'm on vacation, when I'm at the beach and I'm doing something fun. And so it, it has, you know, the possibility to sort of latch onto these viral moments. And so I really believe that there is going to be a winner in the category. And the category is enormous, by the way. Uh, I mean, globally, it's $24 billion. It's growing quickly. A lot of interesting dynamics to it. So, you know, I would say what I'm most passionate about is is like creating, it sounds so corny, I'm trying to find other words, but like a truly generation-defining swimwear brand in a way that there hasn't really been before. You have something like Victoria's Secret that was doing decent in swim, but then they exited the category, but then they re-entered it's a bit of a mess with swim. And then you have, you know, you have companies like J. Crew that come out with seasonal swim, but I, where I think that there's really the opportunity is a big, is a big sort of go-to swim brand. And that's what we're building at Andy, which is why a lot of people say like, when are you going to branch into all these other categories? And like, we're, we're swim, we're long swim. I mean, yes, we do some synergistic things, but we're long swim. I don't know if that's, you know, what you were going for, but no, it's where I say and that's I what I'm most passionate about. <laughs> In in being long swim, you know, you talked a lot about your your target customer who I never actually double clicked on, you know, who that is. But then my, you know, follow up question is like, do you expand within that target group or like how do you see if you're you're going long swim, how do you fo focus mm -hmm. on that, you know, growth and expansion? That's a great question. My mind is going in like a million different places, but I'll start with who our customer is. She's our, our core customer is 25 to 45. And she is like slightly more affluent. You know, our price point is around hundred dollars. So we're not, you know, sort of like old Navy swim, but we're not, you know, we're not like, we're not a res or Maurice here, sort of like multi hundred dollar suits. It's a little bit of, it's, it's a sort of approachable luxury. Um, and so like that woman is, is our core demo, 25 to 45, slightly more affluent, tends to live in urban areas. Although at this point we have obviously, you know, we cross the country, we sell everywhere in order to be the, a real sort of winner in the category or like a huge leader. I think what you're, I assume what you're getting at is that 
you need to be cross generational. You can't just have you know one demo. And I think that that's right. You do need to be cross generational. And I think that Andy is more cross generational than well any other swim brand out there. I mean, we do we do very well with so we're millennial. We do very well with uh, sort of Gen X and Boomer. I mean, we did work with them more, and we have a lot of women who are in that bracket. And in fact, one of my favorite stories that I always see happen is mothers and daughters. And I don't mean mothers and like three-year-olds. I mean, like mothers and their adult daughters are always wearing and buying Andy together, wearing Andy together. And so I think we're making moves, but I think we need to continue doing that. And I don't, I Frank, I don't know if that's within the Andy brand or if you end up sort of launching subsidiary brands to appeal to your Gen Z your Gen X. I think we're, right now we're open and exploring. Um, maybe it's a sort of platform type play, but you know we're we're really bullish on on getting that like you know thirteen to one hundred and three over the long run. Makes us a lot of sense. All right, now moving to our lightning round. So just like quick favorites. Yeah. Favorite omni-channel brand. Can I say Andy? <laughs> okay, but yeah, I'll say sure. you want me to say something else. <laughs> I mean that's like past me what I say, right? But I mean like you know I. I love Levi's and I also like respect them as a company um, a lot. The way they started and where they are today, I find a lot of parallels in our story aspirationally. Great. <laughs> what do you wish you could change about our industry? I wish Tim Cook would roll back the iOS 14.5 <gasps> privacy changes. <laughs> What's your favorite podcast? Am I allowed to say that? Is this on Apple Podcasts? It's fine. It's, I, okay. It is absolutely okay. And we are talking to all <laughs> people who have that same problem that you do. So that is totally okay. Favorite podcast. Um, can I say this one? <laughs> sure. Thank you. I'm right, flattered. Right. Yeah. It's fun Favorite newsletter. God, I get so many newsletters. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of Lean Lux. I'm in the Lean Lux Slack group as well. It's been great for yeah. like industry happenings. Favorite social media channel. I'm a millennial. I have to say Instagram. I mean, if you follow me on Instagram, it's basically all Taylor Swift and my baby. <laughs> Same. Is that the favorite like, preferred social media channel of Andy as well? Yes, it is actually. I mean, and that's not why I said it, but it is where we do our best. No, it yeah. makes sense for your, your target demo. That exactly. Makes sense. Yeah. Favorite, favorite book if you have one. Well, I had a baby seven months ago and I have to say my reading has been a, what's that called? The sacrifice or whatever, the new baby. Um, but I just picked up a book called The Jet Setters, found out at an airport on a solo trip I did recently. So far, so good. It's like a light beach read. I'm not sure okay. if it's my favorite book, but I'm happy to be reading after so long. I, I feel like I did not read at all when I, I had my baby. So I completely understand that. Except yeah. for maybe like I had like a schedule book called Moms on Call that I'm obsessed with and I recommend to anyone. This is what yes, I think is amazing. I have Moms on, I have moms <laughs> on Call. I, I refer to it or I was referring to it frequently, figuring out what her schedule should be. Totally. And then any event that you're excited about attending this year? I have so many. I'm thinking about, honestly, right now my head is thinking about all my vacations I'm going on and whether those count as that counts. events. Yeah. Where are you um, headed? Yeah, I'm going to France in a couple of weeks to see family and introduce the baby to all my family. And oh. I mean, if that, oh, well, actually, technically that vacation is around, my grandparents are celebrating their 70th wedding anniversary. If I don't know if you can imagine being married to someone for 70 years. They're both in their 90s. Uh, and so the whole family is flying over to France for this event. And there's nothing to do with work, but I'm incredibly excited to watch them celebrate 70 years <laughs> Wow. To me. That sounds like an incredible adventure and so special. You'll create so many amazing memories. Melanie, thank you so much for your time. Where can our listeners connect with you? Uh, well, Instagram. I'm just Melanie Travis on Instagram and yeah, LinkedIn. I don't know, what do people normally okay. say? Yeah, they often refer to their own, their website. So like Andy Swim. Oh, well, andyswim.com too. Yeah. I mean, you should, one should visit andyswim.com. It's not the best place to connect with me personally, but it's the best place to go check out everything I've just talked about. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Melanie. Good luck in France. Have fun. And it was so great chatting with you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. If you liked this podcast, follow me and the bridge page on LinkedIn and Twitter for hot takes and tactical advice. If you really loved today's episode, we'd love a review on the podcasting platform of your choice, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening.